On July 3, 1974, at around 8.04 p.m., police rushed to the home of Walter Allenson, a prominent attorney, and his wife, Carolyn, in East Point, an upscale suburb near Atlanta, Georgia. They were responding to a report that shots had been fired. And one of the officers who got that call, Sergeant Callahan, was confused because he knew that police had gone to that house just a couple of hours earlier. On that first visit, Walter had told police that someone had stolen a shotgun. He said that he knew that it was his son, 31-year-old Tom Allenson. Now, Walter and Tom Allenson had been feuding for a while. Lately, things had been escalating. A lot of this was due to the fact that Walter and Carolyn hated Tom's new wife, Pat Allenson. That afternoon, Walter had come home with his wife and their former daughter-in-law, Tom's ex-wife, and their two children. Walter saw that the electricity had been shut off, the phone lines had been cut, and his 20-gauge shotgun was missing. When the officer responded, he offered to search the house, but Walter said it was fine, he had things under control, and he could handle the situation himself. Now, something that looked like it started out as a family drama had turned into a double murder. One of the officers walked slowly down into the dark basement and found Carolyn's body at the foot of the stairs. She was covered in blood and had been shot through the chest. Now, because there were no lights and no electricity, police were confronted with a very confusing scene. At first, they thought they could have some kind of hostage situation going on because they couldn't see Walter and it was dark down there. They wondered if Walter could have shot his wife. Maybe he was down there, lying in wait for them somewhere. So they hung back, fired tear gas in, and after no one came out, put on gas masks and went back down. That's when they found Walter. He had been shot multiple times, in the head, neck, and chest, and was lying in a pool of blood near a small crawl space. When police started this investigation, they had no way of knowing that this case would play out like a real-life Southern Gothic horror novel. All they knew then was that they had to find Tom and his 36-year-old wife, Pat. Now, Pat Allenson had always had a dream. She wanted to be a real-life Scarlett O'Hara. She and Tom, her real-life Rhett Butler, had married two months earlier in a Gone with the Wind-themed wedding after a whirlwind romance. Then they moved into their dream home, a beautiful large mansion named Kentwood Farms, situated on a 52-acre farm in Zebulon, Georgia. Pat was so obsessed with Gone with the Wind that she actually renamed her house Tara. She seemed to be living her dream, but two months later, two dead bodies in a dark basement turned it into a living nightmare. I'm Katherine Townsend. This is Red Collar. Police outside of Atlanta were dealing with two dead bodies in a very confusing crime scene. Now they had to piece together what had happened in that basement, and they needed to find Pat and Tom. They found Pat first. She was sitting in her Jeep just a couple of blocks away from the crime scene. She went with them to the station and told police that she had no idea what happened. She said that she had last seen Tom when they went together to a doctor's appointment at around 3.30 that afternoon. She said that sometime around 5 p.m., he just disappeared, and she said she'd been waiting on him for hours. She insisted that Tom would never hurt anyone, but then she kind of rambled on about how his family had been out to get him. At one point, she seemed to be kind of overcome with emotion, and according to police, she just collapsed. Police didn't quite know what they were dealing with yet, but they did know immediately that this woman was a piece of work. Pat Allenson was born Mary Linda Patricia Vann. Her mom, Marguerite Seiler, had Pat when she was just 15 years old. While she worked, when Pat was young, she left Pat with her grandmother. And in a pattern that would repeat itself through this strange Southern family through multiple generations, Pat's grandma, Mary, raised her and became more like her mother than her real mother. Mary adored Pat. She spoiled her rotten. And when Pat grew up and it was obvious she was going to become a gorgeous woman, she was constantly reinforced for her good looks. So Pat learned at a young age that all she had to do was flash a smile, and she would likely be given whatever she asked for. True crime writer Anne Rule actually gave a great example of this in her book, Everything She Ever Wanted, which, by the way, was later made into a terrific TV movie starring Gina Gershon as Pat Allenson. Like a lot of kids, Pat went through a phase and decided, at one point, that she refused to eat anything except pancakes. So instead of waiting her out or making her go to a room without dinner or any kind of discipline, her grandma actually cooked her pancakes three times a day. A New York Times book review described Pat as a world-class psychopath. Now, not much is mentioned about Pat's biological father, but in 1942, Marguerite met Colonel Brown Radcliffe, a handsome military man from an old New York family. It seemed like she got her happy ending. They got married, and Pat's stepfather raised the kids as basically his own. He was good to them, and they were a happy family. But even then, there were some signs of the ruthless woman that Pat would later become. Anne Rule wrote, Early on, there was something in Patty that went for the jugular, detecting weakness in an adversary, and moving in relentlessly. Another early red flag was her hypochondria. When Pat got sick, she figured out pretty quickly that being in a hospital bed made her the center of attention, and she would continue these hypochondriac tendencies throughout her entire life. She also, in my opinion, seemed to show potential signs of Munchausen, and later potentially untreated Munchausen by proxy, but she was never officially diagnosed. Pat would get huge, unexplained wounds. She was even in the hospital once for possible blood poisoning after she got an abscess on her hip. 
And it was only later in life that people figured out that Pat had been doing this to herself for years. She would stab herself with needles and open her pus-filled wounds with forceps. It got her attention and meant that she didn't have to work. For Pat, self-mutilation beat getting a job at the Waffle House. When she was 14, she started dating an 18-year-old named Gilbert Taylor. And at 15, just like her mom had, Pat found out that she was pregnant. They got married. Gilbert was in the military. But the relationship was rocky. The couple had three children, Susan, Deborah, and Ronnie. But the life of a modest military wife was not really suited to Pat. She had dreams of being somebody, which meant somebody rich. Somebody who could get somebody like Rhett Butler, who could buy her her Tara. We hear a lot about patterns of escalation in serial killers when, for example, they go from window peeping to stalking people, later to sexual assault and possibly murder. There are patterns of escalation in fraud cases and in red-collar criminals, too. In a lot of cases, fraud often starts small, in childhood, with things like shoplifting. Pat was caught at a young age stealing things like baby clothes. And instead of disciplining her, her family would accuse the store detectives of conspiring against her. So Pat learned that she was entitled to nice things, and she could do whatever she had to do to whoever she had to do it to get them. While her husband was stationed in Germany, Pat started telling him that her neighbor's husbands were flirting with her, even hinting that they were raping her. This would also be a theme throughout her life. She presented herself as this delicate southern flower who men just would not stop sexually harassing. She constantly used this ploy to get sympathy for men. She once even showed up at the police station with bruises all over her and claimed that she had been raped. But no evidence was found this had happened, and later, her family claimed that she made the whole thing up. By the mid-60s, Pat was separated from her husband. She went back to live with her parents. Pat's parents, by the way, would continue to financially support her throughout their entire lives. As a divorcee, Pat was in her mid-30s. She was still beautiful, with a great figure. Her skirts got shorter, her heels got higher, and she was soon linked to several men around town. Now, remember, this was a different time, and so Pat did become the subject of some local gossip. Every once in a while, it seemed like her family would mention her getting a job. She only had a 10th grade education and no qualifications, so it probably would have been waitressing or something in retail. But right around then, she fell off a horse, spent time in the hospital, and after that, her family never really mentioned her working again. Now, during this time, she did meet one man who she fell hard for. He was an older politician. He had power and money and everything she wanted, but he was married, and he refused to leave his wife. So by summer of 1973, she was getting desperate. Now, while this was going on, Tom, who was born Seaborn Walter Thomas Allenson, was going through his own romantic trauma right across town. He and Pat had a lot in common on the surface. Like Pat, he was born with a long Southern name. Like Pat, his parents, Walter and Carolyn, were pretty distant. But his grandparents, who he called Nona and Pa, completely doted on him. They kind of knew each other, according to Ann Rule's book, because both of them were very active in the world of show horses. Pat's parents always had show horses. She taught riding lessons to wealthy clientele at one point. Tom worked as a blacksmith. He loved raising and working with horses. He also sold feed at the local Purina factory. Tom was facing his second divorce from his wife, Carolyn, and this divorce was rough. They had two kids, and Carolyn had a drinking problem. Tom was handsome and big. He was six foot three and very fit. Tom's parents had helped him get through his first divorce, but according to Ann Rule's book, they did not approve of his split with Carolyn. At this point, they said there were children involved. They seemed to be worried about Tom's reputation. And also, it seemed that his father, Walter, didn't want to be responsible for footing the bill for Carolyn and the kids for years to come. The friction between Tom and his parents got worse when he found out that not only were his parents not supporting his decision to get a divorce, they actually took his ex-wife Carolyn's side. They testified on behalf of her at the custody hearing. After that, Tom and Walter had a big fight, and Walter kicked Tom out of the house. And that's how he ended up crashing on Pat's parents' couch. He'd done some blacksmithing work for them in the past, and they said that he could stay there in exchange for some work with horses. And when he saw 36-year-old Pat in her halter top wearing jungle gardenia perfume and flashing that sweet southern smile, she soon had him wrapped around her little finger. She started telling everyone who would listen that he was her soulmate. Like everything else in Pat's life, a lot of this turned out to be a lie. Her daughter, Susan, would later say that Pat wasn't really that interested in Tom. And it came out that she'd only started dating Tom to make the politician, her married lover, jealous. But when the politician called her bluff after she gave him an ultimatum, she was married to Tom within a few weeks. Pat's happy ending involved living in a huge home just like Scarlett O'Hara's and finding a wealthy man to make her dreams come true. She knew that Tom's parents and grandparents had money, so she must have thought she was going to hit the jackpot. She showed Tom her dream home, a red brick house near Zebulon. But Tom kind of told Pat to get real. This house was way too expensive for him to be able to afford, especially with all the child support he was going to be paying. It was a dream, 50 acres in total with huge pecan groves, ponds, and gorgeous land. The bottom line was they didn't have the down payment. His parents weren't going to help him, but his grandparents, Pa and Nona, did. They weren't crazy about Pat, but they wanted Tom to be happy, so they gave him the down payment for the house. In return, Tom agreed to make the balloon payments that would later be due. Pat and Tom were able to move on to their dream property. And on May 9, 1974, the same day his divorce from Carolyn became final, Pat and Tom got married. 
The fairy tale did not last long in that house. According to Pat's family, she was jealous of everyone, and this included Tom's kids. She didn't even allow him to put up pictures of his two kids, Russ and Cherry, in their home. But at the time, Tom kind of wrote it off. He had no experience with anyone with a narcissistic or borderline personality type. He just told himself that she didn't mean the things she said. Side note, every time Anne Rule talks about Pat's feigning spells in her book, I'm kind of reminded of another character in Gone with the Wind, which is Scarlet's Aunt Pity. Every time something happened, she would say she felt faint, and she would ask for her smelling salts, and then she would just collapse onto the floor in a very dramatic way. At the wedding, Pat went all in. They dressed in costume. She wore a giant hoop skirt and had a feather in her hair. She even made Tom wear a fake mustache so he looked more like Rhett Butler. They were described in an article in a local paper as two human souls joined together for life. He was probably the first man she could see playing the role of Rhett Butler, and on the outside, it all looked great. But the irony was that below the surface, Tom and Pat had nothing in common. He was pretty much the polar opposite of Rhett Butler. Rhett was a quick-witted hustler. Tom was super laid back, according to friends and family, and he didn't care about money at all, despite his family having some. Other than a fleeting physical attraction, they had nothing in common. And so, predictably, once the wedding was over, Pat got bored. This got worse when Tom lost his job. And all the while, Pat was blaming everything on Tom's father, Walter. She seemed to like the idea of living in this big house and being the lady of the mansion, but the reality of the money that it took to raise horses and make a big house like that work was starting to set in. And like most narcissists, Pat was totally unable to empathize or to see things from Tom's point of view. It was all about her. Pat figured she was able to manipulate her parents into constantly giving her money, so why shouldn't Tom's parents do the same thing? At first, it seems like she probably thought that she would get close to Tom's parents somehow. She probably figured if she was patient, basically, the parents would die off, Tom would inherit the money, and they would get everything. The problem was, Pat was not a patient person. And then there was another crisis. Tom was out of work, Pat was too delicate to work, and the balloon payment on the mortgage was coming up. They couldn't afford it, and Pat knew she was in danger of losing the house. That's when she really turned the heat up in trying to turn Tom against his parents. She was constantly stirring up drama at home. She went from telling Tom that his father had gotten him fired to telling him his dad was part of a conspiracy and the reason that no one else would hire him. Then, on June 28th, just days before Walter and Carolyn were shot, Tom came home and Pat was disheveled and crying. She told him that his father, Walter, had come over to the house and exposed himself to her. Now, this was ridiculous because there were multiple witnesses that could state that Walter had been at work during the time that Pat said he was at the house. But at that time, Tom wasn't thinking clearly. He had Pat telling him to do something, confront his father. If he really loved her and wanted to protect her, he would take care of this, be a man. Tom told the TV show American Justice in an episode titled Deadly Magnolia that during that time, the atmosphere of paranoia and tension between Walter and Carolyn Allenson and Tom and Pat was growing, and it was about to reach the ultimate breaking point over the 4th of July holiday. After the shooting, police were trying to piece together exactly what had happened on July 3rd. Forensic investigators would determine that Carolyn Allenson had been shot in the chest at point-blank range. Walter was lying a few feet away from her. He had gunshot wounds in his face, neck, and chest. Based on the trails of blood in the basement, it appeared as though he'd crawled around before bleeding to death near his wife. Carolyn had been killed instantly. At the police station, Pat was telling police about all the drama that had been unfolding. Walter exposing his penis to her. She said Walter had called her mother and threatened to kill Tom. She said that she was terrified that Tom may have gone to that house to confront his parents. And yet she insisted that her Tom would never, ever do anything to hurt his parents. Unless, perhaps, he was threatened. The hunt for Tom Allenson was on. Soon, the double murder of Walter and Carolyn Allenson became a huge story in Atlanta. Police didn't have to look far for Tom. They went to his house in the early morning hours of July 4th, and he went with them voluntarily. He was arrested and charged with his parents' murder. Tom denied killing his parents. He said that he had not been near that house in months, that he knew that his father had threatened to shoot him on sight, that he would have been scared to go anywhere near that house. He said that on July 3rd, he and Pat had gone to the doctor's office. He said they had an argument there, and that he told her that he was leaving and heading home. He said that he left at around 5 and planned to hitchhike home. But he said that he ended up walking all the way there. Now, this was a distance of between 50 and 60 miles. He said that when he got home, he was exhausted from the walk. So he fell asleep and had no idea what was going on or that anything had happened to his parents until his grandfather, Pa, called him. Both Pat and Tom insisted that they had not seen each other after that meeting at the doctor's office. So, of course, police asked Tom who he thought would have wanted to hurt his parents. He said that Carolyn, his ex-wife, got out of control when she drank. He also said that his father had powerful enemies. Tom said that he believed he was being set up for their murder, and he hired a lawyer. Meanwhile, the detectives processing the crime scene were digging through a lot of evidence. They found a hole under the stairs, kind of a crawl space, near where Walter had been lying. It was large enough for someone to hide in. They wondered if Tom could have been hiding in that little cubby the whole time, while the first officer came to the house. But they found no blood or evidence of bullet marks inside the space. 
They did find evidence of bullets everywhere else. Walter had over 20 entry wounds. He had been shot through the stomach, the shoulders, and the hand. His cause of death was gunshot wounds to the face and chest. Carolyn had died almost instantly. The bullets had ripped off the top of her heart and torn through her lungs. In a twist that it seems can only happen in small towns, Tom's lawyer was someone who knew Walter, too. So when Pat told Tom's lawyer the story about Walter being at the house and taking his penis out and exposing himself, the lawyer put two and two together and realized that he had actually been deer hunting with Walter at that time. So now Tom's lawyer absolutely believes that his client's wife is lying and actually could be the one setting Tom up. He found himself wondering if she may have even been involved in the murders. But Pat had Tom convinced that she was his only hope at that point. He was buying into her us-against-the-world mentality. Tom's lawyer had a lot of trouble getting through to him. Pat caused tons of drama, both before and during the trial. She actually faked a heart attack in the courtroom and was so disruptive that Tom's lawyer asked to have her banned. But she always managed to get back in. At trial, detectives said that two shots had been fired from an XL shotgun, and these shots had been made from inside that cubbyhole. One of the bullets went into Carolyn's chest, one went into Walter. Someone else had fired the other direction, into the hole, several times. Prosecutors had a lot of evidence they could place Tom at the scene because several people, including a policeman, had seen a tall man hunched over running away from the scene, wearing Levi jeans, boots, and a green and brown striped shirt. Prosecutors talked about the feud that Tom had had with his parents and all the incidents that led to the tension in the day of the shooting. Shortly before the shooting, Walter and Carolyn had been driving when they said someone took several shots at their car. They had believed it was Tom, but no one was ever caught. Then, on the day of the shooting, an unidentified woman had called Walter at work and told him to go home because Tom was planning on showing up there. Now, this woman was never ID, but police believed that Pat had set Tom and his parents up, and they believed she hoped they would all die that night. The ruse worked. Walter Allenson stopped on his way home to buy a new gun, which he brought home that day with ammunition. He reported his gun missing, believing Tom had taken it, but that's why he wasn't worried, because he'd already bought backup. Police believed that Pat had absolutely been involved in these killings, but they really had no evidence or proof. So Tom went on trial alone in November 1974. Tom's lawyer wanted him to take a plea and admit to manslaughter. Pat said no way. He stuck to his story, said he was nowhere near his father's house. Then Tom's ex-wife, little Carolyn, took the stand. She testified that she'd heard Walter in the basement, ordering big Carolyn to bring his new gun down to him. She said that Carolyn went downstairs, and then she heard her scream Tommy multiple times while shots were fired. Prosecutors had a harder time with the motive, since, as it turned out, Tom got almost nothing in his parents' will. They had disinherited Tom, and they made this fact widely known, so this had not been a secret. The estate passed directly to Tom's kids with his ex-wife Carolyn, Ironically, the woman Pat hated probably more than anyone in the world. In the end, Tom was convicted of Walter and Carolyn's murders and sentenced to life in prison. And while in prison, Pat was his only lifeline to the outside world. She kept telling him about her bad luck. There was the fire that started at her parents' house. Then, two other mysterious fires, one burning down her home and one of her barns. Of course, Pat collected insurance money from both of these claims. Even though Tom was the one doing life in prison, Pat continued to play the victim. She would torment him. She would wear revealing clothes to the prison and walk in wearing her jungle gardenia perfume and talk about how hard her life was, how men on the outside were constantly sexually assaulting her. She even said that a prison worker, who was a guy Tom knew, had raped her. Tom knew this was just more melodrama. Pat went back to her parents for help, but they'd pretty much already sold everything they had. Tom's grandparents, Paul and Nona, were Pat's next targets. In 1975, Paul had a heart attack, and Pat moved in with them so that she could care for them full-time. Paul and Nona were in their late 70s. Nona had had two strokes and spent most of her time in bed. She had garbled speech, but Paul had been her caretaker doing all of her cooking and cleaning for decades. Pat systematically cut Paul and Nona off from everyone, including their only living relative, their daughter, Jean Boggs. Now they had always had a difficult relationship with Jean, but Pat escalated this feud. Now she constantly talked about how Jean was a money-grubbing vulture. She told the couple that she was really the only one they could trust and soon she took charge of their money. During this time, the will kept getting changed. Three new codicils were added, eventually cutting Jean out entirely and making Pat the executor. The bottom line was that Tom was the new heir, but if Tom was in prison, in real terms, Pat would be in control of a large percentage of the money. And if he died, it would be even easier to collect. Meanwhile, Tom would later tell Anne Rule and the TV show American Justice, he was really starting to believe that his wife wanted him dead. He told Anne Rule that she tried to smuggle pills into the prison, in a Bible no less, and told him that he should take them. Then she said she would go outside and take pills in a parking lot. So, she wanted to do a suicide pact, but she wanted him to go first. She said, don't worry, they'll meet in heaven. He said, no way. In June 1976, Pa's doctor got a call from Pat. She said that Pa had been taking pills and drinking heavily, which his doctor would later tell investigators seemed totally out of character for his patient who he'd known for decades. She couldn't wake him up. Pa went into a coma and was taken to the hospital. A doctor found scratches on Nona's arms, 
Pat told him they happened when Paul tried to smother her with a pillow while she was sleeping. Police questioned Pat, and she had another crazy story for them. She told them that Paul had been acting erratically because he was the one who killed Walter, his own son, and Carolyn, and she said she had proof. That's when she gave investigators a mysterious letter sealed in an envelope with the words, Mr. Walter Allenson, please don't open until I pass out, written on the outside. Police talked to Nona, but of course her speech was very difficult to understand. So Pat was the one who was translating. Now this part is terrifying for me to think about because I think about elderly people I know and how vulnerable they are. First, they're trapped inside the house with her. She's controlling everything that they eat and drink. And then she's translating their words. In this typewritten letter, someone purporting to be Paul said that he was the one who killed Walter and Carolyn Allenson, not Tom. He said that he was dictating to Pat. She was typing the letter because he'd struggled to write since his heart attack. Later, the story was changed, and Pat said that her mother had actually typed the letter. It was actually not a terrible forgery. She'd been pretty clever. She even misspelled similar words, the words Paul misspelled. In the letter, Paul said he had been hiding in the hole when Tom crawled in with him. He knew that Carolyn had been shot, and then he opened fire. He added that no one knew his secret, not even his wife. But experts pretty quickly concluded that Pat had forged the documents. Another detail that made no sense was the fact that the document had been notarized three days before it was typed. So it made no sense. Meanwhile, Walter and Carolyn's daughter Jean was trying to figure out what was going on. She came to the hospital and was horrified when she wasn't allowed into her own parents' room. Pat had had her barred. This must have been infuriating for Jean because, according to her family's description, Jean was tough. So when she talked to police at the time, it seems that she kind of came across as angry and bitter. But Pat, on the other hand, knew how to butter them up and sweet talk and play men. So the police, at first, seemed to want to believe Pat. But Jean knew that something was wrong. She knew in her heart that Pat had poisoned her parents. So she collected hair and nail clippings from her father and sent them to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation's crime lab. Eventually, investigators found a massive amount of arsenic in Paul's system and a smaller amount in Nona's. Pat was arrested and charged with criminal attempt to commit murder. Investigators said that based on the hair and nail growth patterns they saw, they believed the couple had been poisoned over a period of at least six months. It was clear who had done it because Pat had been feeding them all of their meals and had complete control over every single thing they put in their bodies, but she completely denied any involvement. When her trial started in 1977, she claimed that Paul, who she said was guilt-stricken over the two murders, tried to poison himself with arsenic to end his own life. Now, arsenic would be a long and painful way to die. Investigators said this was crazy because even if Paul had wanted to kill himself, he would never have left Nona, who's totally dependent on him, behind. And if he had wanted to end his life, he would have used a gun. He had a lot of them in the house. He wouldn't have chosen a horrible and unreliable way to die and been in constant pain for months. Pat kind of fell apart on the stand. Every time she was questioned about the discrepancies in her stories and the ridiculous so-called confession document, she just played dumb and said she didn't understand. It was a tactic that had worked with men throughout her entire life, but it didn't work this time. Pat was found guilty of attempted murder and sentenced to 20 years in prison. At age 39, she started serving her sentence at the Hardwick Correctional Institute in Milledgeville, Georgia. Shortly after Pat went to prison, she and Tom got a divorce. She was a model inmate. She kept up her lifelong passion of knitting and crafting and started making little Victorian dolls, kind of perfect little versions of the woman she'd hoped to be. She went from Tara to a cell block, but sitting in there with her little glass-eyed dolls around her, she did pretty well. She wrote positive-sounding letters to her daughters, Debbie and Susan, and Susan believed maybe her mom had finally learned her lesson. She hoped that when her mom got out, she would have a new life. Pat was paroled in 1984, after just seven years. She was 47 years old, and this is where her story could have ended. She could have been another middle-aged woman who found a normal job, who turned into a little old lady, doing her craft work and knitting. But then, something else wild happened. As part of her parole, Pat was assigned to be a companion to the elderly. Now, this is totally insane. This is the woman nicknamed the Deadly Magnolia, who was convicted of trying to poison two vulnerable people. And she's now assigned to a place called the Fountain View Convalescent Home in Atlanta. They actually trusted her to take care of wealthy older people, exactly the people that she preyed on before. For a short while, Pat got a job at a local pizza hut, which given her spoiled and pampered background, she basically saw as hitting rock bottom. Then in 1987, she got a fateful call. Someone who had heard about her great work with the elderly asked her to work for a couple, Elizabeth Christ and James Christ. They lived in a mansion in a beautiful neighborhood in Atlanta near the Peachtree Country Club. James had Parkinson's and Elizabeth needed help caring for him. So soon Pat and her daughter Debbie, who was around 30 at the time, started working for the couple. Neither of them had any formal nursing training, so they just made it up. They faked resumes and credentials. Pat said they were both RNs and she had been an army nurse. And just like that, they were trusted to give these people shots and to call in the prescriptions. In 1988, the couple's son stopped hearing from them and he started to get concerned. So he came to visit and he saw in his mother's lunch, crushed up in a salad, something that looked like pills. He took her in for tests. Pat's daughter Susan would later tell Ann Rule that she started to get sick too and doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. She said much later, she suspected that her mother could have slipped her something into the soup and tea and meals that she was constantly bringing her to take care of her in bed. 
It was the same story with someone else, an aunt, who Pat looked after. According to sources, this person became much better after Pat stopped caring for her. But again, nothing was ever proven. Debbie and Pat told Susan that the Chris insurance had stopped paying for them, so they weren't working with them anymore. But then in 1990, Susan got a weird phone call from her sister Debbie. Debbie was accusing Susan of calling the Chris and ruining their job. At this point, Susan, knowing her mom's history, started to get chills. She knew something was wrong, so she called the Chris family. Elizabeth told her that Pat had poisoned them and stolen from them and probably killed her husband James. Susan knew what she had to do. She turned her mom and her sister over to the Fulton County DA's office. Elizabeth Chris told the investigators a horror story. She said that soon after hiring Pat, she was confined to her bed, too weak to move. Pat worked days and Debbie worked nights. They fired the other staff, and they soon had her trapped in bed upstairs. They kept her separated from her husband, James, who was downstairs. She said she was terrified of Pat and her temper. She knew that Pat was stealing their stuff. A Rolex watch disappeared, and old family heirlooms, Civil War relics, priceless family jewelry. Pat and Debbie were hired at $10 an hour each. So on her pay vouchers for her first week, investigators found that she put down 40 hours at $10 each for a total of $400. Then Pat took over the couple's finances and started literally writing her own ticket. By December of 1987, investigators say she was charging for 79 hours for a single week at $12.50 an hour. She charged extra for holiday pay. Pretty soon, she was earning $1,000 a week, then $2,000. Soon, she and Debbie went from $10 an hour salaries to raking in $10,000 per month. When Pat had been questioned, once again, she had said that Elizabeth was drinking heavily and taking pills. When Elizabeth's blood was tested, doctors found huge amounts of Halcyon, a heavy sleeping pill, way more than the recommended doses in her system. She knew that Pat had been drugging her for months and stealing from her. But she had no solid proof. So once again, as happens in so many red-collar cases and fraud cases, someone who suspected of fraud and theft and worse is just allowed to slip through the cracks. The Chris fired Pat and Debbie. In 1991, James Chris died at the age of 88. His death was ruled due to natural causes. And Elizabeth Chris has talked about the worst thing that Pat stole from her. She said it wasn't the jewelry or the heirlooms, but the fact that she'd stolen the time that she had left with her beloved husband. Instead of being there holding his hand, she was drugged out on sleeping pills. Pat was hit with a string of charges. She was convicted of aggravated assault, impersonating a registered nurse, illegal possession of Halcyon, and of robbing her patients. She made a plea deal. It specified that if she admitted to these crimes, she could never be charged with the murder of James Christ or investigated for the murder of Tom's parents. Once again, she was behind bars, sentenced to eight years in prison. Tom Allenson was a model prisoner during his time in jail. He was released in 1989 after serving just over 15 years. He married Liz Price, the woman he had met and had a crush on the woman who had had a crush on him in high school. While he was in prison, he learned to trade. He'd gotten expertise in wastewater plants. So he used this to get a good job once he was out. He settled into a pretty quiet life, found religion, and started volunteering to help other prisoners. Eventually, investigators showed up on Tom's doorstep. And this time, he was ready to talk. He had nothing to worry about at this point because due to double jeopardy laws, he couldn't be retried. They told him that they believed that Pat had set up everything on July 3, 1974. Tom said he agreed. He said after a long time, he had basically made peace with the fact that his wife had set him up to walk into that basement and hope that he and his parents would die. In 2000, Tom talked to the TV show American Justice. He also talked to Ann Rule for her book. Finally, he came clean about what happened that night in the basement. Tom said he was head over heels in love with Pat. He saw himself as a big, strong man who would protect her. He said because his parents had withheld affection from him when he was a kid, he was very susceptible to Pat at first because she seemed to shower him with love. He didn't realize until it was too late that it was all a front. He said his parents hated Pat. Homewrecker was one of the nicer words they'd used to talk about her. Tom admitted that it was him hiding in the basement that day. He said that he had come to the house hoping to talk to his mom to make things better. He said he came that day specifically because his father was not supposed to be home for several hours. He didn't want to wait on the porch, so he let himself in and went to the basement. He said the door was open, and he figured he could hide down there, and if anyone else showed up in the meantime, there wouldn't be a confrontation. But then Walter got that call at work, the one from that unidentified woman who said, you better get home. Investigators absolutely believed that the woman was Pat, which meant that instead of Carolyn coming home alone, Walter came home with Carolyn and the two kids and carrying the new shotgun. Tom waited in the basement all that time while the policeman came and talked to Walter. Then, after the police left, Walter came downstairs and saw Tom in the cupboard. Tom said that Walter started shooting around the walls. He said the bullets were spraying everywhere and he was terrified. He said that he backed up and ran into a shotgun that was hidden in the back of the alcove. This was the same gun that Walter had reported stolen. And yet somehow, this gun showed up fully loaded in the back of this little closet. That's when he said he heard a click and realized his dad was out of ammo. He said at that point, he heard his father call upstairs to ask Carolyn to come down with a new gun. And she did. According to Tom, she fired. He said when she fired the shot, he jumped back and shot too. And that was the shot that hit his mother in the chest. 
When his father started firing, he aimed again and started shooting his father. Then Tom said he ran. And ballistics seemed to match up at least somewhat with Tom's version of events. The gun that Tom used had been fired twice. Carolyn's gun had been fired once. And Walter Allenson's gun had been fired several times. He also admitted something else. He said that he did see Pat after the shootings. He said that Pat told him to find his own way home. And just like he always did, he did what she asked. He now believes that Pat was the one who took the gun, cut the electricity and the phone lines, put the loaded gun into the hole, and called Walter at work. Pat was the one who set the whole thing in motion. He told Ann Roll, Pat was a headstrong, manipulative type person that would do anything to get what she wanted, and you do not know she was doing it. On a website called Full Gospel Businessman's Training, Tom posted as part of his bio, my third wife had been called a black widow, and I got lured into her web. In his entry, he wrote how his faith in the Lord had helped pull him through the dark times. He said that since his release, he's worked closely with the Department of Corrections. He helps minister to prisoners and help them transition into halfway houses. Tom's now in his 70s. There's not much written about him now, but he and Liz appear to still be together and living in Georgia. The case received a lot of media attention, documentaries, TV movie, and the Ann Rule book. When it came out in 1993, the New York Times article read, Now 55 years old and grossly obese, Pat Allenson has had two strokes and can no longer walk or talk. But one finishes this harrowing tale with a nagging fear that it is not over yet, because you can't keep a psychopath down. And as it turns out, the newspaper was right. Pat was released from prison a second time in 1999. Her mom passed away, and she moved in with her stepfather and his new wife. She opened a doll shop called Pat's Pretty Playthings. Then, in February 2008, at age 70, she made headlines again. Pat, who had gone back to being Pat Taylor, was arrested and charged with doctor shopping. According to media reports, she suspected of receiving over 3,700 pills in less than a year. She was charged with three felony counts, unauthorized distribution. Lieutenant Jody Thomas with the Fayette County Sheriff's Office said she's just obtaining an astronomical amount of prescription drugs from various doctors in the area. Normally drugs at that level, we would investigate somebody that they were possibly distributing them. But at this point, there's no indication she was doing anything other than using them herself. I'm not sure about this. The sheriff's detectives say that Pat would go to several doctors and ask for a prescription painkiller, a powerful opioid similar to Vicodin. Whatever's going on with those pills and whatever Pat might have said to them, I doubt that she took all of them herself, especially when I read that she's reportedly been caring for her elderly stepfather. Pat Allenson is still out there. She would be 83 now, even though many people feel she's been directly responsible for at least three deaths. To this day, Pat has never been convicted of murder. Red Collar is an Audio Chuck original podcast. Research and writing by me, Katherine Townsend, with production assistance from Alyssa Gostola and Resonate Recordings. You can find all of our source material for this episode on our website, redcollarpodcast.com. So what do you think, Chuck? Do you approve? <laughs>